What's up, Antonio? Hey, Mark. Welcome. Looks like it's you, looks like you it's rename it's yourself. We're we're um we're five minutes before we go live. Um, however, we are hot mic, hot uh, video. FYI. It's like we're waiting for the the space shuttle to take off. Everyone's quiet. I feel like we should have some some waiting music <laughs> or something right now. <laughs> I, uh, <clears throat> Scott, you got any music for us? Welcome, Ted. See Ted saying hello to all of you guys. Here we have a few more minutes. We're going to get started at five o'clock. Um, I know some people are coming in. So welcome, everyone. Thank you guys for uh, being here tonight. We look forward to having an awesome, informative night with our alumni. So hold tight and we'll, uh, we'll get started shortly. Right in your life, right? Scott, are we ready to go? You are live, yes. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Antonio Borja. I'm the director for School of Industrial Design here at Academy of Art University. Um, it is my pleasure to uh, bring you guys today's uh, alumni roundtable where we'll be discussing being a successful creative designer. We have an awesome group of panelists from various industries and various backgrounds. 
And we have the pleasure of um, this event being moderated by one of our very own as well, Jonathan Tai. So uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and get it started. Um, we'll do a few more introductions at the end for some of our students, as well as some of my colleagues here. Mark is, is here joining us um, as well. So thank you, Mark, for joining. And uh, like I said, we'll go ahead and get started. Jonathan, if you can take it away. Thanks, Antonio. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jonathan Tai. I go by John. Um, and I was a 2012 graduate of Academy of Art, uh, the ID program here. And uh, currently, I run Hatch Duo, a product design firm here in the Bay Area, as well as a um, lifestyle brand called Aggregate. Um, but enough about me. Let's let's start to put the spotlight on these talented panelists here, and some of whom are actually some of my classmates. Um, so why don't we go around here and let's briefly do a one to two minute introduction, where um, each of you can kind of tell the audience who you are, where you currently work, and what your role is on your team. So I'm just going to go since there's no seats here, since we're all digital. Um, we'll start with Sun, um, since he's top screen. So Sun, why don't you tell everyone um, who you are and give a brief introduction. Hi, um, my name is Sun. It's nice to meet you all. So I'm currently working at the Samsung Design Innovation Center in Bay Area, um, mainly specialized on wearables such as smartwatches and hearables. So I'm a lead ID designer here, responsible for, of course, bringing uh, top-notch ID design, but also find out human behavior and create new user experience for the features. Great, thanks, Sun. Um, next, why don't we do Kevin? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Reyes. I currently work at Nike. I am a footwear designer, and currently I am designing uh, basketball running uh, training footwear. Uh, uh, focused uh, mainly on bringing premium performance at accessible price points, um, which is a pretty big deal for Nike. Um, and yeah, I've been there for five years and it's been great so far. Thanks, Kevin. That's awesome. Uh, next, we have uh, my former classmate and roommate, Sid Bot. Thanks, John. Uh, my name is Sid. I work at HP as a senior industrial designer. I've been there for seven years. I also graduated from Academy of Art in 2012 with John. Um, my focus on consumer electronics and lately it's been on VR headsets and gaming uh, peripherals and gaming products overall. Thanks, Sid. Next we have Mary Tolosa. Hi, uh, my name is Mary Tolosa and I actually graduated Academy from 2018, but I started at Academy um, as a pre-college student from 2012 to 2013. I currently work at a global bike company called Specialized Bicycles in Morgan Hill, California, so South Bay. And uh, right now, um, I actually started there as an intern in 2018, got hired on full-time in 2019, and then recently um, got promoted to CMF designer. Um, so as a CMF designer, I kind of help lead color, material, and finish on um, our products. So we have bikes, helmets, shoes, apparel, and bikes, helmets, shoes, and apparel. Yeah, those are it. Um, and yeah, I just help lead that with the director and work cross-functionally with our entire like team. And yeah, that's about it. Awesome, thanks so much, Mary. Next, we have another one of my friends, Melvin Dominguez. Hey guys, uh, Melvin Dominguez here. I graduated uh, from the Academy of Art in 2012. Uh, yeah, I, I currently work at Ford Motor Company. Uh, I've been there for about three years. In the last year and a half, I've been, um, I, I joined a team called D Ford, which is an internal design organization within Ford Motor Company. Uh, we're tackling some of Ford's biggest challenges and I'm particularly assigned to the autonomous vehicle LLC. So our team is dedicated to really uh, understanding what autonomous technology is and what that means for our business and moving people. And what that and we have to envision what that service is going to be. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's really challenging. There's a lot of unknowns, and uh, it's yeah. I'm I'm really happy to be working there. Awesome. Thanks, Melvin. And last but not least, we have John Rare. Hi everyone. I'm glad to be here. Uh, so my name is John Rare Johansson. I 
um, from Iceland originally, came to San Francisco in 2014, where I studied industrial design at the academy and also played soccer for the athletics program. Uh, graduated in 2018. After that, I got an internship at Fuse Project, where I'm still working. And um, yeah, I did an internship for, I think, half a year, something like that, and then got a full-time position and been there for now full-time for a year and a half. And my role on the team is um, on industrial designers. And since it's a consultancy, we work on all kinds of different products. So there's not really anything uh, specific that I work on, just um, a, a part of the industrial design team. Awesome, thanks so much, John. Um, yeah, so that that's our intro of these uh, talented individuals that we have uh, here this evening. Um, so, you know, the point of tonight really is to talk about, you know, what it takes to be a successful creative in uh, industrial design. And so um, we have a few questions here that uh, I'd like to jump into. And for all of you, um, there's six of you, so feel free for anyone to jump in and I'll kind of just moderate and and uh, if, if, if we end up talking over each other accidentally because it's digital, no worries. I'll just kind of, um, you know, point you out after and then we can have everyone get a turn to answer. So the first question here is, what was your biggest breakthrough or turnaround point during your time here at Academy of Art in the industrial design program? I'll leave it to the floor for anyone to jump in. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and mention one right now just because uh, I see the name in the panel, uh, and it, while it doesn't sound so much like a breakthrough, actually, it was failing Ted Renteria's class. Um, I think from that moment that I failed his Transportation Design 2 class, kind of made me realize that I had a lot of, uh, I had to mature a lot, and that meant cutting out a lot of toxic people, uh, counterproductive relationships, and just sort of uh, sticking to people who really believed in what I was doing people who genuinely understood my motivations and what it took to sort of get to where I was trying to go, even though I didn't truly quite know myself, uh, but I knew I wanted to move forward in this, in this career path. And um, really that only came down to my parents, my girlfriend at the time, now wife, who understood that stuff. And it's really difficult to do, but I think finding a way to focus on what you're paying a lot of tuition for and investing a lot of time into, uh, it requires drastic measures you know sometimes you hear athletes talk about making these type of sacrifices i don't want to talk this career up as if it's that huge but i think if you want to get somewhere you need to make a considerable amount of um, sacrifices yeah absolutely um son did you want to jump in here sure um so i was an international student from korea so luckily instead of a specific point every single experience was new and fresh here for me. And um, AAU classes were a perfect place to enjoy the diversity of the culture. And that was how I began to listen more, getting into uh, listen to people more and getting interested into the people's little unique behaviors. In terms of like breakthrough or, or turning point for you, like what was that for you? Like, was there a point where you're just like, all right, this like, I'm actually gonna make something of this. Well, Obviously, you know, I mean, we're all students here, the freshman year versus like the senior year. Uh, it's very different, right? Yeah. Um, I think, um, as I mentioned, I'm from um, other countries and getting to know the cultures and understanding about little different things were actually very difficult for me at the first time. Um, yeah. That includes the language, too. Mm. So... We are speaking different languages, but we know how people act and then communicate with uh, the specific languages. So I really try very hard to understand like how my design react, uh, received to the people and try to understand like what made people like more interesting or not. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, like the point I need to go through and gave me a pretty good lesson. Nice. Um, let's see here. Can I jump ahead? Yeah, jump in. Um, for me, I think the first thing that comes to mind was 
think that summer where I didn't need someone to give me my like summer homework or, you know, kind of like the off season stuff that you kind of have to do. Um, I think that's when I kind of felt like I was breaking through or turning point as you will. Because I think what that brought upon was kind of like the self-awareness. You kind of have your own uh, self-conversation about like knowing what your strengths are and then what weaknesses are that you need to work on or I needed to work on. Um, and I felt, and I just kind of made my own to-do list for the whole summer and kind of went at it. Um, and that also made me realize, I think to Melvin's point, like who do you want to spend time with, right? Like the people that bring that positive energy and kind of like those people that take away the time and energy, like those get cut off. Um, I thought that was a turning point. Uh, so it, it helped me with my skill set and also just kind of like knowing that you, I really loved what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems a lot of a, a trend here where there's like this turning point of like self motivation where you know you just you just want it for yourself where you're just doing you're putting in the time and the hours yourself. Um, Mary, did you want yeah, to? Yeah. Um, speaking of that, yeah, I was like in my last product class. Um, and the brief was either like something internet of things related, or you could do your own brief. And I was like, okay, like I'm going to do my own brief. Cause that's like, I'm not really into IOT and like, I'm just going to do this on my own. Like, of course, like checking in with our instructor, like Mark was my instructor and, um, yeah, like I ended up. Um, I was really interested in soft goods and like CMF. So I went that route and like reached out to my mentor who was in, who's in footwear design. Um, and he like mentored me through the whole thing. And my goal was to do my own brief and then use this time in class as like my submission to this like one project. And if I get in, then I get to go to like Massachusetts for this like program. And that was like my goal. And like, I don't know, it was like part of me, I just like that was just like my passion, you know, like I just wanted to go for it. So I did and did whatever I had to. Um, but like I ended up going that route and like doing these check-in sessions and just doing it all on my own. And then ended up getting into that competition to go to New Balance. And then at the end of that whole thing, I ended up like somehow being awarded that CMF um, like certificate. And then from there on, like everything just like fell into place and like I knew like CMF was like my thing. And then that's also right, right when I got my internship at Specialized too. So it just like everything just fell into place. Cause I like, it was just like a clear thought that I was like, all right, like CMF is real and I like want to do it. So yeah, it's funny how all yeah. this fell into place, huh? Yeah, but. Awesome. Um, let's see here. I think we still need to hear from. Can I go? It's Sid. Yes. All yours. Uh, okay. Um, I think my biggest breakthrough in the AU was similar to Melvin's perspective. Um, I was in Ted's class in Product Design 2, and that was kind of when I realized how much work I would need to put in to succeed. And um, it's a really difficult class. I didn't do well in the class, but I did put in a lot of work and it was just a huge learning experience and just a realization of just how much work you need to put into that, uh, in, into to actually get better and improve. And then from that on, I, next year I went to, I did product design three with uh, Adam Weaver and I applied the same, basically everything I learned from Ted in terms of work ethics and took uh, all of Adam's teaching points as well. And that was kind of like my first kind of project that I really liked and really enjoyed. And from that point on, I was just loving, um, loving life at the AU. I was just doing something I really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, and last we have Sid. Yeah. Um, for me, it, it wasn't so much, I guess, breakthrough moments, but affirmation that this is what I wanted to do. Um, the first was PD1 with Chris Myers. And first of all, I learned so much from Chris and he was super hard on us. And that was a great experience because of the first time we were actually designing something. I was so excited for that. And I think the topic for the class was ergonomics. And so everyone did like a power tools type thing, like something to handle. I thought that was really boring. So I decided to challenge myself and push myself and I did a scuba mask to do facial ergonomics. And 
it was kind of a dumb decision in hindsight because I killed myself just to get it done, but I did it. <laughs> and it was just I awesome that I pulled it off. Uh, I think you remember that, John. It was pretty bad, but I pulled it off and I was really proud of myself that I worked that hard. I understood how hard I needed to work to get to that point. The second one was PD3. And like John mentioned, we were roommates and he was ahead of me in school, but he took a year off uh, to intern at Whipsaw. And so I gained a lot of knowledge from him and seeing what it needed, what the, the kind of workload and work ethic you need to succeed in the industry. And I took that as motivation going into PD3. And so I was super motivated and I kept thinking, whatever I get out of this class, I'm going to use it for my portfolio to get an internship. Unfortunately, the project we got assigned was, I think, the dumbest project I've ever seen in my life. And I straight up told the teacher, I'm not going to do this because I'm not going to get a job with this uh, project. It's not a portfolio piece. And that was the biggest thing for me. Having that mindset, kind of like what Melvin said, you're paying so much money for the school. Everything you should do should lead towards something tangible. And for me, it was getting a job. And so in that moment, everything changed. Where it's like everything I do has to be leaned towards that. Otherwise, I'm wasting my time. So that was a huge, huge moment for me. Yeah. So it sounds like, I mean, from a lot of uh, a lot of the, you guys right here on this panel, it's it's a lot of um, self-driven where you you hit this point where you kind of know where you want to go and and nothing's going to stop you, whether it it's uh, the assignment or if it's just, you know, um, going through different internships to get there. It sounds like you, you guys really, um, you know, have found your way, like going through these different programs. Um, cool. So um, the next question I have here that, uh, I mean, to the theme of this event is what defines a successful creative designer and under what conditions may that definition vary? I mean, I can take that first. Um, for at least in my field of consumer electronics, the biggest thing is design, not just designing something, but designing something for mass production. In school, you, know, you can design whatever you want, but I, at least when I was coming out of school, everyone told me you're not designing until you ship something. So when you start working, that's when I realized designing in school is completely different from designing in for something that's mass production, designed for uh, uh, DFM, we call it, and fighting for those millimeters and fighting through the cost of everything. It just means so much more. And it's such a different challenge. And that's what really drives you to really have a lot of pride in what you do when you see that end product and how much blood, sweat, and tears went into that and how much you have to fight to get that end product. So that's what it kind of means to me. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's a good point. Have any of the rest of you kind of experienced that when you get to design for manufacturing? Uh, yeah, I wanna just build on on that point. That um, I think, yeah, the what makes a successful industrial designer is taking the product from a concept phase and uh, taking all the way into production and uh, to people that people can enjoy and use and. Uh, makes their lives uh, better in some way or another. Um, I think, yeah, that uh, definitely defines a successful industrial designer in my eyes. Cool. Anyone else? Yeah, for the for the CMF, like from the CMF standpoint, I think what like defines like success per se is like really understanding your consumer. Um, and then also like thinking about like research and like trends and all that, you know, and then um, really telling that story through CMF on the products um, and just, yeah, color choice, material choice, everything. Like it just, you just need that emotional like connection between the consumer and product. Um, yeah, that's what I think. Got it. Oh, uh, someone just asked, what is CMF? CMF is color material finish. I'll, I'll mention uh, one thing too, and what makes the, the automotive industry particularly challenging is uh, we don't produce cars on a regular basis. So there's some people that you might encounter in this career path who are, I would consider successful, but may not have a bunch of cars out on the road. Um, but to me, the way I see success is those people who know how to uh, rally around ideas, uh, get the team around an idea, be able to pitch that idea, 
uh, to move uh, certain things forward. For me, being in the mobility transportation sector, I've been working in advanced studios where I don't know if any of this stuff is ever going to see the light of day. Uh, but that doesn't make it any more or less fun for me. But working under leaders who are able to sort of continue pushing these ideas forward, selling this upward, so the executive level starts to see and understand the value of what you guys are proposing uh, as a good direction for the company to invest in for how they should diversify going into the future. Um, that's how I sort of perceive uh, successful designers, at least in, in uh, my realm. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a great answer. I think I'll, I'll jump in with a footwear perspective. Um, uh, for, I think, in the footwear design industry, I think what would define success is being able to take, you know, your cool little sketch, cool little doodle, and I think anyone who's at a footwear project before, you know, you do like, you know, a couple doodles in your notebook or whatever, um, and it looks cool, you've never seen it before, um, being able to do that and actually bring it to life, um, that's, that's, I think, what defines success, because a lot of times, you know, down the, down the pipeline, whether it's like performance issues or something kind of breaking or whatever, uh, pain points, cost um, comes into play a lot of times. And I'll just, you know, just general like perspectives or sometimes you're close to the finish line and it's just not like, it's just not hitting that mark and you have to, you have to like pivot and it happens all the time. But those moments where you can take your initial like gut feeling concept and you can just figure it out all the way to the end. I think that's probably like, at least for me, like, yeah, uh, that project right there, that, that's, that's amazing. Thanks, Kevin. Anyone else have anything to add on that question? No? Um, yeah, I mean, just a little bit of extent to uh, what Seed and John mentioned. So what I realized after shipping a couple of products, um, to be a successful designer, I think one of the most important thing is we need to understand that not everyone is an ID uh, industry designer. So we have all different understanding about the products and the beauty of it. So you need to be very flexible and also um, you know, like you need to like have more opportunities to listen to the people who is the out of the market. So have a, like a more like a larger spectrum of the perspective. Mm -hmm. Being able to work cross disciplinary, essentially. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's definitely a good point as well. Any anyone want to add anything else before we move on to the next question? No. All right, next question. This is a fun one. So what was your experience in transitioning from the academic environment to the professional environment? I'm sure all you guys have very interesting stories on what that transition was like. So I'll leave it, I'll leave it to the floor to, for someone to jump in and answer this. Anyone? Uh, I can go. First, um, so for me personally, um, the transition was quite humbling, to be honest. Um, coming in from school into a work environment, which in my case was Fuse Project, was, um, you know, you just learn quickly that you, there's so much that you don't know, and there's so much that you still, um, yet to learn and um and that yeah from that point you just have to work extremely hard to try to catch up with everybody else who is already there and um learn uh, different programs like for me like specifically was 3d modeling was a, uh something i really need to needed to improve on um, both 3D modeling and renderings that I really worked hard, uh, hard on during my internship. And um, so, yeah, that was my experience going transitioning from a professional to, uh, no, from a school to professional. Yes. I'll, I'll jump in here. Back. Go ahead, Kevin. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my experience transitioning was basically the realization that 
you know, um, there's so many different functions that um, involve like a single product. I think when you're in school, um, it's mainly you, or if you're working a group, you and your group mates, but regardless, it's like it's design and then your instructor. Um, and then getting into uh, when I started working in the industry, you know, there's your engineer and then there's your cost engineer and then there's the business side, you know, the, and, and you have to learn how to balance all that. And it, it was a little bit of, like, of a culture shock. I think I would say like my first year, I was, I, it, it was kind of a daze, uh, but you know, you, you stick to your guns um, and you, you just kind of go back to what you learned and eventually like it becomes more normal. And then you, all those other functions actually start to help you become a better designer because you start to see things from a multitude of perspectives rather than just purely um, you know, your own perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my experience was similar to what Kevin said, just learning about the other different business groups and interacting with them. And the challenge was explaining the value of design to those other groups who may not understand it. You know, when you're, you're a designer and you have that eye for design, everything seems obvious to you, but the challenge is explaining the value of that to the other groups who may not be familiar with design. So that was a little bit, a little bit of a trial in the beginning, trying to figure that out. I think the other aspect was um, projects get canceled. You know, that was a really, really tough for me. In my first three years, I only shipped one product, but I had 10 projects canceled just due to the cost or just whatever reason. And so going through the business side of that was really important for me. Um, and just a great learning experience. On the positive side, it was just great to get paid for my ideas. I, I just, you wait three years to finally get paid for this stuff. So that was really awesome. Yeah, Matt, and I mean, it's like the cliche of getting paid to do what you love, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's still kind of weird sometimes when you just stop and to think like you're getting paid to draw, you know? Exactly, <laughs> oh my God, pretty yes. crazy. So that's, yeah. the, that's always something I remind myself to like cheer myself up especially like in 2020. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. I second that. Um, but yeah, I had a similar experience to like John and Kevin and Sid too. But um, yeah, it was super humbling just because it was like, I started as an intern there and it was a new industry for me. So I, I like was a cyclist, but not like hardcore cyclist. So I didn't realize like how big like the cycling industry is and like how many just like road, mountain, gravel, like all these types of bikes and products that I was not aware of. So for me, it was like just listening in and everything and observing all this information and taking it back and doing research on my own and then applying like my skills from school and like um, other experiences into my role. Um, but also like at the end of the day, like my team or the team at work was like super chill and laid back and everyone was like friendly. So I always asked questions. Um, and just wanted to learn everything I could. And yeah, like learning about all these new, like, or different, or like the business side of things is just like completely new. And like talking to the product manager or like the factories or like merchandising, making sure our products are good to go. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, like what Kevin said, like you get paid to do what you love to do. So it, it works out. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I'll weigh in with uh, two things. I think the first one I heard from John is just like kind of this humbling introduction to when you jump into the studio and or whatever creative environment you're in and you realize how little you know. Uh, that's always a, 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 a big one. But also I like what, what Sid was saying too, is like you're then working with, you might be working at a small consultancy or big consultancy, but no matter what, you're gonna be interfacing with a lot of people who are not of your same discipline. Right. And um, communicating the value of what all these other disciplines do and also, you know, negotiating for what needs to come forward. Uh, that was a, a major, um, a major thing to be getting used to. Um, yeah, because yeah, I can imagine, yeah, I can imagine yeah. the, in, in classes, you have full control over your project. And then when you get out there, you, you have to kind of. Exactly. Navigate. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyone else want to add to that or respond? I think if I could add one more thing, if you, don't, if you guys don't mind, yeah. I think it's also interesting to notice that your transition into the industry, like I just wanted to point out that I actually took a lateral move out of college or out of Academy of Art. I actually ended up working in e-commerce for a little bit. 
uh, I didn't want to go to Detroit. I didn't want to go to LA um, to work in the auto industry, but I was hearing that companies are starting to creep into the Bay Area. Uh, so I wanted to position myself for what I was hearing they were um, expecting from, from potential, um, you know, or how they were going to build out their team. So taking those side moves sometimes in order to get to where you want, uh, don't be afraid to do that in making that transition. And I guess transition in this context is a little different. Uh, it's not literally transitioning from out of school into the work environment. It's that whole entire transition of, you know, who you are, what you want to do and how you get there. Um, so uh, it was a, it was a topic in, in, the, in the Adobe Max conference today that I find really relevant to this conversation, actually. Yeah, no, that's interesting how you had that much, um, you know, vision to kind of, uh, you know, plan ahead so to speak, and, and, and have that much faith that that was all going to happen. So it's, it's great that it's worked out for you really well. I think maybe one last bit on that too. I, I just remembered, um, I just kind of went back on like my first couple months, uh, being exposed to like other designers who have been at it a while um, and seeing just like how many talented people are out there. Uh, it just kind of, reinforces the idea of there's always something to learn. I think when I graduated, I had that feeling of like, yeah, I'm the man, like I got, I got this. And then you see some, uh, some of these amazing guys just be so good with it. And you're just like, all right, I, I got, I got some work to do. You know, that, that was also like um, the transition uh, experience. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. I mean, when I joined HP, the team was a lot older than me. And I learned so much from him. There was, there was a guy who graduated from Art Center in 75, and his first job was at HP at 22. And he was there for 30 years. And I just learned so much from him. And I was, I think, like 27 or something. I was by far the youngest, 10, year young, 10 years younger than anyone else on the team. But there was still so much for me to learn. And it was like a sponge the first year or so, just learning as much as you could. And just seeing how talented everyone was. It was just really inspiring each day. That's great. So, um, so moving on to the next question, what drives you all to design? Uh, I think I'll, I'll go first. Um, I, I think just goes back again. Like I love, I love drawing. I like sketching. I think that's one of the one of, one of the things that kind of got, got me to uh, gravitate towards industrial design. Um, and just coming from like an immigrant standpoint, first generation, when I, when I came here really, I, it's not even an exaggeration. I only had like the clothes on my back, <laughs> um, kind of starting from the bottom and then kind of going through kind of that phase of just like trying to figure out what my place is. Um, and then realizing that I can um, provide for myself uh, and my loved ones by designing. Um, that's what drives me. It's like, you can do what you love. Um, you can innovate, you can create, um, and you don't, you don't have to really sacrifice, sacrifice doing what you love just to like, you know, um, provide for yourself. I think that's probably one of the most amazing feelings. Uh, and, you know, uh, I think it's just like, if, if you, I think every, everyone can agree here, like once you graduate and you get to feel that, it's just like something you appreciate all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I can go next. Um, for me, it's kind of like two things. One is, and this may be a personal opinion, I think there's a lot of shitty designs out there. And I like to think I'm doing my part to combat that by putting out quality of work. So that motivates me every day. And I think the other thing is just why I fell in love with industrial design in the first place. Just the idea of taking something from my imagination and bringing it into a physical form is just an amazing feeling that never, ever gets old. And that motivates me every single day. Yeah, I'm sure all of you, when, when you've seen, you know, the thing you've worked on finally hit the shelves, it's like, it's like a baby, right? <laughs> that feeling never gets old. No, it does not. Yeah. I'll, I'll take a stab at this because I, I think it's, um, for me, what drives me is the opportunity to be working. So, you know, Ford is responsible for a lot of things. Uh, but I think the one thing that I'm, that drives me the most is just being plugged into their autonomous vehicle efforts. For me, growing up as a kid, like I, I love, I love cars. Like I have older cars, but I've always been obsessed with Star Wars. And I feel like 
I'm in this like balance of working with vehicles traditionally being Ford Motor Company and who, what they represent, but also being like at the beginning at the pipeline of what could potentially be a revolutionary technology out of some sci-fi age dream. Um, but it's, it's, it's uh, getting closer to reality. So being at the forefront of that, looking back at this point in my life and saying, cool, I had something to do with that. Uh, to me, that's the biggest driving factor. Um, apart from that is understanding all the challenges that come with this, um, you know, uh, being out on the field and talking to people, understanding their pain points, kind of bringing that to the team, advocating for individuals um, as, as part of the creative process to try and, and get their input to make sure we deliver the best product possible when the time comes. I think those are the things that motivate me the most. I think for uh, for me, it was uh, similar to what uh, you guys were saying in terms of uh, just growing up. Uh, I really enjoyed drawing, and sketching and uh, building stuff with the Legos or whatnot. And so it was kind of like, um, I kind of decided early on that I wanted to be a designer just because of I always enjoyed doing building stuff and creating stuff. Um, so that was kind of my driving factor in the beginning and the reason why I got into it, it is because I love doing it. Um, what drives me to design now is also just uh, similar to uh, what Sid was saying in terms of uh, there's already so much stuff out there and that uh, putting some quality work out there, quality products that are really Im impactful for people and their lives and make them and really makes uh, their lives better in some way or, way or another. Anyone else have anything to add? Yeah, uh, I could. Oh. Go first, please. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I could go. Yeah, uh, similar to like everyone else had, that said stuff. Um, yeah, my family actually, like my grandparents were like artists and then my parents like were like a generation skipped where they were like all dentists and like doctors, you know, like the like, traditional like um, careers. And then my cousins and my sisters and I are all like designers, artists, like anything from like fashion, ID, UX, graphic, like everyone in our family is just like um, somewhat creative. And for me, like I grew up with all of that and my dad was like always the handyman. So he like kind of gave me the problem solving side and then like my other family, like the artistic side and putting those two together into ID or CM like now I'm a CMF designer, like that just like, it's just like somewhat like the puzzle just fit together. Um, but now like design, like what drives me to design is just like, like what I said earlier, just creating, like for me, like the CMF part of it is just like creating that emotional like connection between the product and the consumer. Or for my case right now, like the bike or the helmet or the shoe and the rider, um, just really like making sure there's a story there and like the reasoning and yeah, just making it more meaningful. Um, Cause at the end of the day, it is another bike, but like the story behind it and like the connection with that rider is like super important. Son, you, uh, I think you, you were going to jump Yeah. Back. Okay. Um, so for me, um, the beginning was from the very small experience with the Walkman. So um, such a small product, but the music experience that I had by the time with the earbud was shocking by the time. So um, that's how I started to really enjoy physical product, but also functional and experience behind it. It was like a magic. And now it's up to designers, like how their musical experience to be delivered to the people in the world. And I think it's very fascinating. Um, after I become a little bit more professional, what these days really um, drives me to design is actually how you design is how you communicate with the people. So like paying attention to the details and putting a lot of effort behind and make it simple as possible. That's how you communicate with the people and how you actually live. So I think that's very um, 
uh, fun part of my job. Influencing the lives through, through design. That's great. So I have a pretty interesting question I was, that was submitted here. If you could go back in time, what would you have changed about your educational experience at Academy of Art? I'll, uh, I'll kick that one off actually. And, and just quickly saying that uh, embracing all parts of all parts and aspects of the education that you're receiving, I have to admit, uh, 3D modeling, I hated alias and uh, turned to eventually it was a detriment uh, to myself. Uh, and I, that was probably one of my biggest regrets is just sort of putting that, um, you know, not prioritizing certain parts, thinking that, oh, I, I just want to do X as part of this career field. But in reality, it's one of the best things you can do to just understand every single aspect because it helps you better communicate with everyone that you're going to be working with in the future. Yeah, I remember that was a tough class. <laughs> Anyone else? And you know, I'll, I'll add one more thing to that, John. And the reason why I say that is because sometimes through the transportation side of the program, at least you hear some people say, oh, I don't need to learn how to sketch because I'm gonna be a clay modeler. Right, right. You know, I, I just don't agree with that attitude. Right. Yeah, it's good to kind of soak up uh, everything you possibly can because you never know what you're gonna face in the actual field. Um, no, that's great. How about the rest of you? You guys have things that you would have, if you could go back in time, maybe you could either change or advise for yourself. Uh, I have one now that I was thinking about. Um, like when I was in school, I did not think a lot about manufacturing or understanding manufacturing and, and uh, materials or those kind of details and though it's like not a super important factor in school but I just thinking back now I wish I would have uh, gotten more knowledge in in those things those technical aspects of of uh, making a product mm -hmm. and those yeah a little bit of like engineering aspect but also so materials and how they're made and all of those processes I was so was more familiar with them going out of the AU and I, I would have focused more on that. Here's a follow-up question to that though. Like um, had you had you known or, or taken more courses in like technical manufacturing, do you think it would have hindered your creativity? Because I think there's that debate, right? Like of like yeah. you know too much too early on, you're not as like creative. Um, exactly. I fully understand. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a good point as well. That might might very well be the case. For sure. Cool. Yeah, but, I kind of agree with John. Oh, sorry. Is someone else going to jump in? No, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I kind of agree with John. I kind of wish I'd learned a little bit more about manufacturing um, and materials. Um, it's such a huge part of consumer electronics. And but it's it's I'm you know you learn so much every day on the job. So I'm picking all that knowledge up, you know, in the past seven years. I think the other thing is I kind of wish. It isn't maybe not so much education, but more about experiencing the city a little bit more. I mean, John, you know, we lived in the East Bay. We took fucking BART for like three hours each day. And so I was just never in the city. So I didn't have that inspiration. I didn't go to the MoMA. I was just like, I'm here for school and I'm going to go home. And I wish I had experienced that a little bit more and get a little bit more inspiration, design inspiration, just from the environment around me. But I was just so focused and so heads down in school. I didn't really think about that. And I kind of regret that. Yeah, so uh, word, word of the wise to future students live near school. Like we lived in the East Bay, so commute time was definitely, uh, you know, part of the, the day when we're, you know, working on projects and stuff. So something to consider. I think for me, if there was something I could change, it was, it was like, I, mean, I wish I would have gotten comfortable earlier, being uncomfortable in terms of, um, asking questions and just kind of digging and um, trying to find solutions through just like, you know, if you have a, if you, if you don't have an answer to something, just trying to ask as much as you can. Um, I think when I, when I was at school um, and once again, like I had just moved to the United States. So I was 
always a little hesitant to ask someone something, um, either instructor or, or fellow student or uh, someone who is above a couple of classes to me or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and, you know, you find out later on that when you're when you're working, you have to be used to, well, surprise, working with other people. Um, and so this kind of like exercising that mindset of like, I need to be able to work with my team. I need to be able to communicate. And that's something I have to practice every day. And if, if that involves asking something and they're like, uh, it's obviously this is the answer. And I'm like, sure, um, it's fine. That's going to happen. Um, getting more comfortable with that, I think something was something that I feel I wish I would have gotten like more used to. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? All right. Well, I can get to the. Oh, sorry, Mary. Did you want to jump in? No? I mean, I was going to, sure? but yeah, it's okay. Go ahead. go ahead. No, I think for me, it was like I was in school, but also I was working part time. Um, and I wish I. I mean, I. Some of us have to. Some of us don't. I don't know why I did. I think it was to keep um, just like side money coming in or whatever the reason was, but I wish I didn't have, I didn't like work. So I could just a 100% or 120% like focus on school, you know, like it sucked like, oh yeah, I can't meet for this team project. Cause I have like a two hour shift or something at Nike or whatever it was. But, um, I think that's like my only like thing that I would change is like, just to like not be in, not have a job and just like just focus on school more um it was super challenging especially when I had PD2 and work like that was like insane like having Ted's class mm -hmm. um, everyone knows how Ted's class was but it was a great class for sure but um super challenging um yeah yeah no it's interesting you say that like would you say that though obviously like you, you would have wanted to have more time to work on the fun stuff at school, the projects, but probably I would, I would bet that your time management skills and your ability to work faster yeah. like, carried over into your career now. Right. Yeah. So that's another thing. Like you just had to like really manage your time well and um, really communicate like with whoever you're working with. Like for me, I was like working at Nike SF part-time and like a makerspace a different time. Um, but it was just re really being open to like your boss or whatever, like, hey, like school's still like really important to me. Like I could only work X amount of hours, you know, like, um, but yeah, and just like communicating. For sure. Anyone else have anything to add to that? No. All right. I have another question here. Um, are you part of the hiring process uh, for your design team? And if so, can you share some of what they're looking for when conducting interviews? I'll leave that to the floor. Wait, uh, can, is, can you repeat that again? Sorry. Um, are you part of the hiring process? It doesn't mean you have to be the hiring manager, but you know, if you're part of the hiring process, if you can, please share some of what the the team specific to your company is looking for. So for, for you, Kevin, it'd be Nike or say it'd be HP. Um, what are they looking for? I'll try to take that one. Um, so the hiring process for our particular team is interesting where if there is anyone who's new coming in, every member of the design team gets to interview the person just because as a lot of you guys know, you, you're with these people so much, you're, your fellow designers, it becomes kind of like a family, a little bit, a little bit dysfunctional family, but it's a family. And so you don't want to bring anyone in who can, you know, mess that up or mess up the chemistry dynamic. And so that's part of our process to make sure everyone gets the chance to talk with this person and see, you know, if there's any personality clashes or anything like that. But I think the thing that we look for in our particular team is just adding value. Can you, can this person come in and bring in some fresh ideas? Obviously a lot of people we're looking at are usually 
graduates or interns, uh, at least lately. And so it's all about, can you bring some fresh ideas that are maybe not tainted by the idea of manufacturing? And so you have, you're very like unfiltered. And so that's really important for how we do things. Uh, for, if I um, speak, so for our company, um, design-wise, we um, really cares about the person's design language style. So having a variety of design language on his portfolio will definitely help. Um, and of course, like um, knowing a little bit about the process and um, the functions that will add value to. But most importantly, we also um, really cares about the person's personality. Like if the person can be a part of our family, we can rely on to him and we can grow up together. Yeah, personality is definitely an important part, isn't it? For chemistry and team chemistry. Anyone else? I think from what I've experienced, at least with, with our team, um, it's having one uh, a very well-rounded um, kind of uh, set of skill sets, if you will. You know, so all, a lot of the stuff, um, sketching, uh, problem solving, I think process, uh, the process of how you get to the solution is also like very important um, because you're gonna be working within a team of like other designers and so, if you guys are working on a shoe together, um, you have to be able to communicate like your, your ideas and solutions, you know, fairly efficiently. Um, and, you know, to no surprise too, I think to what everyone said, uh, you know, you know, teachability, moldability, and just like team chemistry is also like accounted for. Um, so, you know, um, if I could give advice to all the, you know, students here, um, being a nice guy still counts in the world. Um, so uh, take that with what you will, uh, but it still counts. That's great advice. Anyone else with anything to add here? All right, well, there's a bunch of questions I see happening in the chat. So for now, I will pause on my questions and turn it back over to Antonio and the student reps to see um, you know, if there's any questions we wanna ask from the feed. Thanks, John. Um, I, uh, I we do have uh, three students, three student panelists who are going to be asking questions on behalf of the chat, as well as some questions that were already sent in uh, prior to the event via email. Uh, so first up here is going to be Santiago. He's going to ask a question to the panelists, and uh, I'll let you guys take it from here. Yeah. Um, hi, guys. I'm Santiago. And the first question from the students would be, how do you achieve a healthy work-life balance while working on a highly demanding field? I'll, I'll go ahead and start that one off. But I think I would just like to emphasize that your health and well-being should always be number one. I think in retrospect, uh, pulling all those all-nighters, as much as we amongst ourselves would brag about it and kind of of a rite of passage, it's, it's, really, it's really not good. The consequences of it um, in, in studies that I've been following up on just out of curiosity is like, I often wonder what did I do to myself and will I feel those effects someday? Um, Cause it's not good. Uh, but I would definitely just remind ourselves that there's a time and a place to kind of bite down on your mouthpiece piece and just move forward with everything you got. Uh, and obviously it varies from person to person. Some of us are dedicated. I mean, I look at John and see how much he's done with his consultancy and the great deal of motivation that requires. But, you know, all of us are going through life differently in different circumstances and, and you have to take that for what it is. Um, I, I kind of balanced my perspective. I had two uh, family members um, in the last four years who died a little too soon. And I, I have to I have to strike a balance because you never know when, when this stuff is, when, you, when you're gonna go the way I see it. Uh, enjoy your life, live healthy, take care of yourself. Um, but also realize that if you want to be in this career, there's some sacrifice and uh, there's going to be moments where you really have to hit the accelerator. So be wise when you do it. Um, I like to second that. I, I totally agree. Um, 
And one thing that stuck with me, uh, actually, when I was going through school, and I still think about it to this day, Antonio used to always tell us, you know, work smarter, not harder. Um, and so for me, when I was going through school, I think my first, you know, year, year and a half, I, you know, I think you, we all do it. Like we do our all-nighters, we do this and that. Um, I was also like working part-time um, because that's, I needed to work my, I needed to work my way through school. So I, I figured out what, what my threshold was. And it, it was, it's almost like if you can make that into a pie chart. So um, I knew what my threshold was um, and it's different for everyone. Um, I figured out uh, I should, you know, do X amount of hours for like my part-time job. Um, and obviously it, once I started reducing that so I can do more schoolwork, obviously my, my part-time income was not that great, but then I just started cutting out, you know, other luxuries and kept it minimal. That's what worked for me. Um, and like I said, like you didn't, you you kind of stave off any long-term effects of like pushing yourself to the point of like you're affecting your health negatively. Uh, I think I I really agree with what you guys are saying. Um, and I would just like to second that, that um, it is really important life work-life balance is really important and you just have to pick your moments of when you are working really really late nights and not i am uh, lucky enough that fuse project has a policy where you know we work sometimes really late to prepare presentation for clients so we're like working into the night but then you'd get the next day off for example uh, it kind of balances itself out that way but um and that's because the company, you know, is just allows it to happen. And um, so, yeah, I think it's really, really important. You can't keep on going uh, by not focusing on your health and having fun or just enjoying your life. It's not also it's going to affect your work if you don't enjoy life. Yeah, I agree with what everyone said so far, 100 percent. And I think the thing the students have to understand is your job is to be creative and you fundamentally cannot be creative if you're dead tired every single day. So you absolutely need that balance in order to fuel your creativity to do well at your job. And so that's fundamental for any success for anyone. That's actually a great point. Um, you, you, can't, you, can't be, you can't come up with those fresh ideas if you're like always burnt out. And that's super true. Yeah, also, what I realized um, is, first of all, um, don't drink too much. It's not good. It's inspiring, but it's not good. Um, second, I try not to have a too much argument with uh, people who doesn't understand ideas. Like having a healthier conversation with uh, like a great designers, it's going to inspire you. It's going to make you healthier. But like wasting too much energy on someone doesn't understand, it's just not good. Yeah, I like second everything everyone has said so far. And like working from home now is even more challenging just because sometimes you're just like glued to your desk, you know, like, oh, it's like two o'clock, like what happened to lunch, you know, or lunch. Um, but like really just taking care of yourself as everyone said, and even like, going for a walk or like standing up and like walking around the house or like going for a bike ride like it just like you really like I just want to emphasize that like health and like well-being is always important and yeah like sometimes you have to grind like it happens but yeah yeah just to stay current with the times and acknowledge like what's been going on how have you guys been uh balancing work and life being remote um, I know how we do it for our company, but I'm just curious. Yeah. For different companies. Um, yeah, I could start. Like, so my team is actually half of our design team has always been remote. So it only like a couple of us or uh, a couple of us have on the team, like are officially like work from home. So we've always had like zoom meetings and whatnot, but it is really challenging when the, the couple of us who are usually in the office are not there. Like we're, usually like in there like ideating or like in the paint booth you know like testing out paints or like mixing or whatever like it's just been really challenging 
um, just to not be in like that creative zone and just like kind of stuck at your house. Um, but we've been trying to like make it work, trying to have less Zoom meetings. Um, and our office is actually open somewhat to only if you need to be there. Um, so sometimes we'll like meet in the office and like look at um, like products in person, like safely from a distance. Uh, but yeah, it's like trying to have less Zoom meetings as possible. Yeah, to kind of add to that, it's <laughs> so many damn Zoom meetings. It's insane. And it's, it's tough. Sometimes it's like a five minute meeting just because you can't walk over to someone's desk and just chat with them about something. So it adds up and it gets really, really hectic. Um, the other tough part is kind of what, uh, you know, you were just saying, uh, it's just evaluating parts. Now I get parts shipped to my house and that's kind of irritating. My wife hates it. I have parts all over my floor and my dog's chewing on it. So that's, you know, frustrating. But also because um, I'm working on VR headsets, I'm constantly thinking about how to improve that process. And we're talking about a lot at work. We've been meeting in VR. We've been having virtual meetings and engaging in that manner and trying to see if that could be a potential workflow for us. It has its pain points, but it's exciting to see the potential of where we could take that. And it's not too far off. It, it's definitely been um, been an adjustment. There's there's like some trade look a lot of good and also like some trade offs to those good. I would say, for me, um, the 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 big, I, I think the 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 best kind of upside to working remotely is, you know, if I'm I'm feeling like I just need to kind of reset, I could just take my dog and we go for a walk in the middle of the day. I, it doesn't really matter what time it is, you know, as long as there's obviously no Zoom meetings. Um, some of the downsides is like I feel like some of the breakthroughs happen you're just walking over to someone's desk and be like hey I have this idea or I have this um, sample of my design I, I really want to push it that extra 10% and that like five minute conversation could totally change it um, zoom is st still very uh, very useful but it you know it's really hard to get that kind of um, that conversational walking over to someone that's sort of uh, uh, you know when sparks just go you know just like that and you're going back and forth um, another thing probably would be um, well those those times when like I said sometimes we just kind of have to bite down and just kind of push through it you know it's a it's kind of that busy time it's hard to separate from work when work is all around you at home it, it used to be like when you come home from work you just okay that's the barrier. That's kind of like you've crossed over to just like your, your personal life. That's that, that is like, I feel like sometimes I'm, I'm like sitting on the sofa. I'm like, okay, I'm done now, but I'm still like thinking about work. So, but the good part is too, like when the not so busy times, so you can, like I said, pick and choose your spots to be like, all right, maybe just put, put the computer down, put the pen down for a second and just kind of enjoy the sun outside. Yeah. I second that as well. Um, I feel the trickiest part for me personally has been separating from work. I feel like I'm living at work um, because like there's no separation between like going to work, you go to work and then when you go home, you don't even have to think that you can just leave it all behind, go home and you can relax. Um, and it just, it's a little bit harder sometimes to separate and just go and just shut everything off and just enjoy the quietness. Awesome, thank you guys, great answers. Um, we're gonna have uh, Dennis ask the next question. Yeah, so um, next question is, have you had any experiences where competition interfered with your collaborative spirit? I would say, that, sorry, sorry, I just want to clarify the question, competition within the workplace or what did you mean by that? Um, yeah, uh, like, you know, let's, let's say you're, you're designing something. The uh, marketplace is closed, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of background noise here. Uh, 
Sorry. Uh, let's, let's say let's say you're designing something, right? And you have a competition from like an, another company that's also trying to oh. tr- trying to you know build something. Um, you know, if you're working for Samsung and then you know they just release a new iPhone and now your direction just has to change, or you know um, something along those lines, right? So, like if you had a, if you had a great idea right before this new release from your comp- from your competitive company. And then suddenly everything just kind of collapses right in front of your, right, right in front of your designs. Right. So like what, how, how do you react to that? Got it. Uh, sorry, Kevin interrupted you. Go ahead. Oh yeah. Actually I thought it was a different question, but um, just going off of like the clarification, I would say, yeah, that's, that's happened in, in a way uh, for me. Um, sometimes, you know, certain things and, you know, certain, things that are happening in the marketplace will cause, you know, the designer to have to kind of shift, shift gears. Um, it, I would say like first couple of times it happened to me, um, it was definitely like, it, 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 it's a hard thing to get used to because, you know, when you're at school, you're working on your project, like you kind of see it through from like week one to, you know, the, the final week, finals presentation, or as going through, like you're right dead in the middle and being like, oh, not, uh, I really have to shift gears and you know deep down too like even if you want to resist it like yeah we kind of have to so um, it's happened quite a bit it, it it's kind of you know a little bit unpleasant in the beginning but at the, at the same time that's when I think when we go back to like keeping yourself sane and and having a healthy life balance is it comes crucial because then you can kind of take a deep breath reassess and just break things down to the, to its simplest form like what are you doing and then what do you need to get to and how you get there um it's part of the ebbs and flows but you know what it, at the end of the day it's all good it's it's designing anyone else I would say um, actually those kind of things are happening a lot. There is a lot of conflictions and then like people's needs are um, sometimes um, like happening just like how we mentioned, like we try to launch a product, but Apple just announced the product that we thought we were gonna, uh, it's good so we are about to launch. But you just need to be um, very flexible and that's actually the time it requires like another design within two days or three days type of um, the schedule so you just need to get ready for it and make sure you have a uh, many additional ideas so you can react to it yeah all right we have um I'm gonna move on to one more question. Um, Kim has a, another question prepared for you guys. And then after that, um, the student panelists themselves will, will also ask some questions of their own. And then we'll also look at the chat. So um, all the attendees, if you guys, um, if you all can start uh, posting your questions, uh, we'll go through them as, as they come in. So right now, again, Kim, if you can answer, or if you can ask your question, please. Sure, hi. Uh, I'd like to know, what's your favorite thing about working at your current company? I'll start by saying, I really like my team. Uh, I think one of them should be on the line today. She said she was gonna be in and uh, listen. But I think uh, the team is really cool that, that I'm on. I love everyone that I work with. Um, it's, it's diverse minds. I'm not, we're user experience designers, industrial designers design researchers, um, information architects, uh, interaction designers. We're this really cool eclectic family uh, that really uh, able to sort of construct on each other's ideas. Um, and it, it creates this really good healthy competition where we're able to sort of pass on knowledge to one another. And that to me is absolutely the best thing. And also being a part of the D Ford organization it, I'm starting to understand that it's lending itself to so many other opportunities to meet other people uh, from things that I want to learn and immerse myself in and potentially even shift uh, career trajectory in in the future. 
Yeah, I kind of agree with what Melvin said. The same situation for me. I really love the team I work with. I work with really talented designers and I learn from all of them each and every day. And that really pushes you to be better in your designs. And what's great about our team is the projects I work on are actually stuff I'm passionate about. I'm really passionate about VR and the future for that. And so I get to work on that and define the future of where things go. And so our team is really, really good about that, as well as encouraging us to you know, take breaks and have a good work-life balance while also be inspired at the same time. So it's a really, really good environment for me to be creative. I think for me, um, well, firstly, I, I, I love, I, I would second everyone with everyone saying like, you, you know, having a great team around you um, becomes kind of part of your family. And also you learn from those people too. So just like having those interactions every day and kind of growing with them um, is something that I truly value. Um, and another thing too, uh, for me, uh, I grew up watching basketball, playing basketball. I, I love the sport and I just, you know, I, I like, I love sports in general. Um, and so b being able to work on product that is involved within the sports realm, um, that's just kind of like a little bow on top of the, you know, things that I work on. Um, oh, can I go? Okay, I'll go. <laughs> um, for me, it's, yeah, I second everyone. Like, I love my team too. Like, I work, I get to work with apparel designers, graphic designers, industrial designers, and um, and everyone is just great. And like, not even just designers, but everyone else outside of like the design team. Um, and then another part of it is like, Specialize is like a pretty big bike company in like the bike industry. Um, but our teams are like pretty small. So you get to wear a lot of different hats and get to touch a bunch of different products too. Um, so for me, like being able to not just work on shoes but also work on bikes, helmets, have like a say in apparel and shoes. Like for me, it's just getting the opportunity to like just get a different project and like just play with what I can and create things um, within the company and just, yeah, like all the opportunities that they give you is just like really awesome. Um, for me, I think, well, I want to second what everybody said. Um, my favorite thing is the team and how everybody, like, they're always so open to teaching you and they're just in general really nice people. Also working with, um, you know, it's a pretty small studio, Fuse Project. It's not a lot of people that work there. So uh, the environment there is really you know, it's a small studio, so everybody knows each other and you get to know everybody pretty well when you're so close to, that you kind of get really close to the whole company um, and do stuff together. Um, and yeah, just some really multidisciplinary field or studio. So I get to work with um, graphic designers, user experience designers and strategists really closely and uh, learn from them. So that's uh, really good point, I think. Yeah, for me to um, say, like, no question, the first reason is good people at the company team. But another um, the great thing about our company is they have a power to make uh, design happen. So whatever the design we do, they have a capability to make it happen, no matter what cost it. So I think uh, that's like one of the biggest benefits I have right now. All right, awesome, thank you guys. Um, so we'll go ahead and move on now to um, the questions that have been asked, kind of been some prepared ones and some that have been coming in through the chat. Um, but I also like to give the opportunity to uh, Dennis, Santiago, and Kim to ask their own questions. And so if anything that hasn't been covered, if you guys can uh, go ahead, we'll have uh, Santiago get started on this one. Yeah, um, I had a big question about um, more like 
it, it might defer by every company, I, I suppose. But my question is more like, um, what are the opportunities or how do you find the opportunities to show your value? Maybe if you want to go somewhere else within the company or if there's a different project that you're interested in, um, how do you show sort of like your value and to be able to move to that different project? Be nosy and offer help. Can you elaborate on that, uh, Melvin? If, if there is a yeah. time when you actually were sometimes, being nosy in another studio? Sometimes you just hear things that sound really cool. I think how I got into the autonomous vehicle team was sort of similar. Um, just heard that it was happening, that they were looking to build a team, kind of kept tabs on the pulse of what was happening, kept sort of nudging the person who was leading that until eventually I got sort of um, uh, got taken into the wave of where the project was going. Um, kind of being there, asking questions, uh, watching him do a little bit of prototyping and then asking if I can lend a hand. And that's how it sort of started. And then that's how I got involved into this particular project. And to be honest, if something else that was more interesting came about, I might do the same thing. But in the, for now, I, I don't see myself doing that. Yeah, I agree with what Melvin said. Uh, I've done that a few times. I mean, I think the current project I'm working on, I can't talk about it too much, but I wasn't supposed to be on it, but I saw some guys, two of my designers were, were meeting and I just sat down in the meeting and then I, I got assigned the project and then, you know, my design won out, but that just happens sometimes. And it's, my, my manager's pretty good about knowing our interests and trying to gear projects towards our interests so that we're more passionate about that. And so that's really encouraging for us as designers, because then we start working on stuff that you actually care about. I can go. Um, for me, like, I sort of created the CMF position in the company. Um, previously, we didn't have one. Um, so my previous role was color design, just specific color. Um, but I, you know, my passion has always been CMF and just like the tactical side of it too. Um, and I saw a disconnect within like our soft goods team or like not soft goods, but like our footwear and like, um, and like our equipment team, like there was opportunity there. So I kind of just did like, my research and um, gave presentations and showed how we can integrate this role into the team and elevate our products. Um, so it was just me like really researching and being passionate for something I stood for and something that I could see like the company elevating their products with. Um, so, yeah. All right, anyone else? All right, um, Dennis, you can go forward with your question. Cool. Um, yeah, so I would like to know uh, during your guys' hiring process, um, whether it was at, your, at the company you guys currently work at or any other company or intern that you guys have had, um, what was the big portfolio piece or pieces that stuck out to um, the hiring manager that really grabbed your, sorry, that really grabbed their attention to you? Um, I'll just jump in on that one. Uh, for me, um, there was there was a couple and it, it, it kind of appealed to different people uh, i would say i did um i i have my senior project was my one and only like footwear project and actually it was the one that made me realize that i wanted to go to footwear um that was basically the project that got me uh, my internships so i interned in new balance and uh, at reebok before i got to nike that's what landed me there and then that project still actually got me the interest from Nike. And another one was, uh, I, did a, I did a camera project for my PD5, I, I, from what I remember, um, 
my junior year. Uh, that's actually the, the project that my hiring manager just, he told me that he really loved just based on like understanding a form. Um, if you're trying to get into footwear, you know, the, you're, you're also sculpting like midsoles and whatnot. And so he wanted to see an understanding of form from like who, who he was looking into. And he felt like that showed it for me. Yeah, I think for me, um, my process of getting hired at Fuse was a pretty interesting one. Um, I was selected to be uh, one of the two finalists from IAU to be in the IDSA Student Merit Awards, where we uh, presented our portfolio in front of um, a, a panel of uh, design studios around the Bay Area and got a lot of feedback on that portfolio. Um, and after that, um, after that semester, I, I had written all of the feedback down, I really detailed, all of the feedback was super detailed, they were super helpful. And I read, redid my whole portfolio from scratch, which means like redid some of the projects from, from scratch. Uh, and Resent the portfolio to all of the people in the panel. And from there, I got the intern interview at Fuse Project. And from there, I was hired. So uh, I don't think it was anything, one particular project. I think it was just this saw that I turned around all of the feedback pretty quickly and really delivered on all of the points that I had uh, given my uh, feedback on. Yeah, just I'm going to add it that skill sets and everything was there, just the way you presented, communicated wasn't quite, and you answered to all the comments they made, it made your portfolio that much better. I think that's a really key point to get to where you are now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, well, um, I'm gonna go ahead and give the floor to Kim one more time for her to ask her own question as well, Kim. Hi, thank you. Uh, my question is about criticism. Um, how do you manage the criticism that comes with being a designer? And how do you not take it personally when you put so much passion and, and uh, of yourself into the design? Thank you. Ted's class will, uh, was something that worked wonders. Uh, I think he, he forced us to all see that it's not about you. It's about what you put on the wall never take it personal. And I think from that moment on, having people who are just very honest with you and have the ability to communicate that difference between the work and personal, kind of moving that forward into the real world, I think that helps to, I never take things personal or I try not to, um, and just sort of see that it's, it's, a, it's an evolution, it's a development. You're likely never gonna have the answer every single time. And I think if you understand that and you kind of have that sense of humility around what you're putting in front of people, that it's subject to change, it's not perfect, it's a process, uh, it's, you're developing things. I think from that point on, um, you, there's no reason to really take things personally. However, if people are talking in a way that's demeaning or kind of that type of language that does feel personal, then maybe it's a studio problem. Yeah, I, yeah, would... I agree with, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, you, you go first. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, I agree with what Melvin said. Uh, for me, it was uh, Chris Myers and PD1. He really kind of drilled into us that I'm critiquing the work and not you. And it was even from like the first week, he you know took someone's presentation board and put it through a bandsaw. And that was like, okay, it's, it's, he's critiquing the work and how you do things. I actually think that was his Facebook profile for several years, but so that was like, okay, day one, don't take it personal. And I think in the working world, everyone's working towards the same goal. Everyone wants to put out a great product that represents the company. That's what you have to understand. When people are giving critique, it's not about you, it's about how do we make a better product that represents our company? And once you take that in, you can just keep going with that and take that critique internally and just pump out better products every single time. No, no new sort of um, surprising insight here, I think. It's to it's basically consistently saying what you guys are saying. Um, you 
you get used to it um, as part of your training throughout like your years doing ID in uh, AAU. Um, you learn quickly, like like you guys said that you know it's the whole process of like you're when you're getting critiqued. That's not for just so someone can have fun. That's just to prepare you um, and kind of like you know just kind of um, battle hardening you, if you will, uh, to prepare you for the real world. Um, and so you, you just kind of get used to it. Um, I, I find with me too, it's just um, always focusing on the next thing always helps too. Like once once you get once you once you get your uh, your baby out, you know, you know, appreciate oh, you, you appreciate and smell the roses, but also after that, you know, have your eye on the next thing. Um, uh, being focused and motivated actually like helps you not like take things too personally. Uh, coming from like my experience, especially like in, like with sneakers, you, you, you go on the Instagram like you, people are just like, oh, that's dope. No, nah, that's no, nah, that's whack. That's not it. Um, and I would say I was just like, I don't, <laughs> that doesn't really phase me. Um, just keep focusing on the next thing. Um, and, you know, you just enjoy what you do. All right, anyone else? All right, so I see, um, I see a few questions here uh, in the chat and, um, you know, I think, you know, we're running up against uh, the clock here. And uh, one thing that I can probably, you know, summarize some of these questions into one would be, what tools are you using now because of our current situation that you look forward to implementing into your workflow? Obviously, you know, for a lot of us, Zoom and teleconferencing is just something that, that's new, but um, I can tell you a little bit from the educational side of things, you know, we've started to use a lot of VR sketching and AR presentations, as well as, um, you know, doing concept evaluation in VR and AR. And so that's a new pipeline for us. So is, are, there any, are there any new methodologies or just processes that maybe um, have made you reevaluate, you know, now that you're using these tools that maybe you weren't um, using before? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you, Antonio. I, I kind of touched on this briefly before. We're doing a lot of VR collaboration. I can't get into too much of the specifics of what we're doing, but we're trying to create a workflow that works well because, uh, frankly, we don't know how long this whole remote thing is going to last. And in some companies, they're going permanent. And so we have to adapt. Um, and that's part of the things I'm thinking about each day. How do I create new tools or adapt the tools that we have to the virtual world in order to make collaboration seamless from the physical to now remote. And so that's really important, something we're working on. And VR has been a huge, huge benefit. I think one collaboration tool that I'm personally using quite a bit is Gravity Sketch. It's personally, in my opinion, I think it's the future. It's combining CAD and sketching into its digital format. Um, you know, we got an intern recently from Arts and, and he has an entire class dedicated to Gravity Sketch. And I thought that was incredible. And, really kind of exciting that design schools are embracing that. I'm not sure if AAU is doing that, but hopefully in the future, you guys do that. Um, but I do think that's the future and it's not gonna go away anytime soon. Yeah, well, we can happily tell you, we've been doing Gravity Sketch now for two years. We're one of the premier uh, Gravity Sketch uh, institutions in North America. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's to me again, the first time I tried it and um, it, it was it was definitely game changing because now you can iterate um, and fail faster, right? <laughs> fail faster to succeed sooner, right? So that's that's one of those things where you know you're 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 being able to experience your design in context and one to one scale much faster than ever before. And so I mean that is something we identified and we've added actually to our digital imaging class uh, where. We're now starting to expand it. You know, at first it started out as just being an intro part of it, but now we're doing a few more sessions where, um, you know, it's definitely a tool that we see moving forward that we're not going to to move away from. If, if anything, we're we're jumping in with two feet and and expanding it to more than just being a, a few modules in the class. That's great to hear. But how come you didn't come to me to get some VR headsets? Uh, we need to talk about <laughs> that later. 
right. <laughs> any anyone else with any other tools? I mean, I know, like I said, I mean, if any, like again, I'm not obviously, you know, you, there's proprietary processes and whatnot at play here, but you know, more so like, um, you know, I, I can give you guys another example for us too, like, you know, this whole new concept of whiteboarding collaboratively, right? So using the tool like Miro, Miro or Concept Board to kind of work on projects together and have a digital space where we can all look at the work together. You know, that's been something for us that that's also, we started implementing it in the studio classes and, you know, quite frankly, it's like, yeah, I love being in the studio, but this is a really great alternative to not having that. Yeah, I, I I agree with that definitely. I think um, we have been using Miro a lot um, as a collaborative collaboration tool as a whiteboard, and it is a really really powerful, a really really powerful tool. Just the fact that you can put a sticky notes everywhere, and you don't need to worry about taking them down or losing them or or you know running out of space or or it's just it's something yeah I really enjoy and I see. I'll definitely continue using that after this pandemic. Awesome. Any any other things, John? John, I know we haven't uh, really put you on the spot, but maybe this is this is one you know where where are some of the things that maybe you and your team are doing that um, again just you see is doing uh, uh, you know moving forward regardless of if this continues. Yeah, um, no, definitely to Sid's point, we, we're seeing a lot of young designers be pretty interested in VR um, and Gravity Sketch as well and ideating with that. Um, but, you know, in terms of our workflow, yeah, we, we, we definitely use Miro. We use Slack, um, a combination thereof of, of that to remotely collaborate. And uh, yeah, for us, we, before the pandemic, we were already, you know, we're a small studio to begin with. We had people all over the Bay Area. So some people had kids, didn't want to commute. So Miro and Slack remotely collaborating was kind of the, the norm for us even before. So awesome. Yeah. Anyone else? Any other any other uh one else want to jump in, son? Uh, yeah, I mean we use just like other companies use Slack, uh, Zoom, um, a lot of programs, but these days it keep coming back to me, the most important thing skill set after like uh, working remotely is actually a presentation skill set. Cause like you don't talk in person. So you need to be like a very precise and, and make sure you deliver the right message with your designs. Um, but probably it's just me, but I see that like designers not the strongest skill set is the presentation skill set. So like having a little more attention to those things will be really effective. Yeah. Awesome, thank you for sharing. Kevin, Mary, any, anything else? No, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, like our half our team has already been remote. So we've been, you know, Zoom, Slack. Um, we did just get Miro and we love it. So we'll probably continue using that. Um, but other than that, yeah, just a lot of Zoom calls and emails and typical stuff. Similar here, um, Miro has actually been a, a, a huge help at least um, at Nike just cause it's a big company and so um, before before all the COVID stuff happened, if you wanted to see have visibility on what another team is working on, you'd have to like, work across campus or walk across campus, which is kind of basically like a mile to like see it. And Miro has unlocked basically visibility. You can you, you, everyone can collaborate cross functionally now, and just it's because it's so super it's super convenient. Um, and so um, Miro is definitely here to stay. I think from what I've experienced so far. Um, and, may, and maybe just as like, this is nothing new, but at least from what I experienced um, going into footwear, I used to be primarily like a Photoshop guy. Um, well, I would say like to anyone of the students that are looking into get to footwear, you know, just get acquainted with Illustrator because it, it's something that you'll be um, interacting with 
90% of the time. Not to get it twisted, being great at Illustrator doesn't mean you're going to be a great designer. Um, so don't be like just focusing on that, but just make sure that you dip your foot into it uh, just so the adjustment the adjustment phase is, is you know, is a little bit more easy. And also getting used to cobbling, like know how to sew. Uh, you're not going to be building the shoe yourself, but being able to take swatches of materials and all that and kind of put them together um, uh, just to see how they all come up, uh, how they all fall together. Um, that, that also actually really helps. Awesome. Thank you. Well, um, our time together has, uh, has come to an end here. Uh, you know, we're, we're already uh, a little five minutes past. Uh, I really want to take this time along with uh, Tom, Mark, and Hideki, um, Andy, um, the whole team at Industrial Design to, to thank you guys for your time today. Um, we really appreciate all the insights you, you guys have given the students. Um, you know, we, we really uh, are proud of you guys, first of all. And it's it's great to see again, uh, you know, what, again, I just feel like it was just like, you know, maybe last year that you guys were roaming the hallways and I was talking with you guys uh, at the warehouse. And it's it's kind of crazy to think back that it's it's been now, you know, a few years since that's, that's been the case. I think John, you know, is the most recent one, but even, you know, John feels like, you know, like yesterday as well, too. So, um, you know, enjoy your times and, you know, enjoy your lives in the sense of, you know, the work life balance. I would say you guys, you know, all seem to be doing really successful. So, again, make sure that um, you guys continue to enjoy what you do. And, and I think, you know, in hearing you guys today, it sounds like all of you guys really are passionate about um, where you're at and what you're doing. So that makes us also really happy and really proud. And, um, and the fact that is that, you know, for all students who may be interested in uh, doing, being a creative designer and, and going into creative field, um, I know from the face of it, it may feel like, you know, we're just learning to draw and you're gonna be sketching all the time. But really what we are is we are problem solvers that can visualize the solution to the objectives that we're given. And I think if, if you don't lose sight of that, you can be very successful in this industry, whether you, you go into footwear design, whether you go into transportation design, um, electronics design, bicycles. Um, it's, I think at the end of the day, if we keep that in mind, be empathetic towards people, you know, remember at the end of the day, we're designing for people. So we always have to keep in mind who we're designing for and keep in mind that person. And so, Again, and hearing your guys' stories today, it, it makes it makes us really proud to see that that's that's what you guys are doing. You guys are empathetic designers. You guys have logic to your approach. And again, from the, the pieces that you guys showed us for Instagram, you know the aesthetic beauty is there as well too. So you guys really embody what it means to be an Academy of Art University alumni. So thank you guys for that. So with that said, um, I do want to shamelessly plug, we, we will have a CMF um, workshop starting, uh, you know, next, uh, next week with Emma Lundgren, um, you know, who will be uh, going over, we'll, we'll send more details out via Instagram. Also next week, uh, we also have one of our very own, some of your guys' former classmates as well, um, Aaron Gould, who is uh, one of the designers on the Ford Bronco, will be doing a presentation on that as well for, for next week. And more details will come up on that on Instagram as well. So we look forward to having you guys for future events. Um, Sid, I got you. I'm gonna be talking to you soon about this VR right. world. We're, we're, uh, we're all in and uh, no, we're, we're definitely excited. Um, there, there's a lot of opportunity there, I think for everyone. And I would say again, for a lot of young designers, Remember all this cool technology we have, it's just a tool that allows us to solve the problem that we are given. Um, and I think if you guys, you know, keep that in mind, like I said, you guys will be successful. So thank you everyone. Have a great night. Thanks guys. Thank you. See ya, thanks. Thank you, bye. Thanks. Thanks. All right.